New Zealand locked down hard and locked down early. Today there are no active cases in New Zealand. We have had two cases. These are two women who recently arrived here from the United Kingdom. More new cases of coronavirus are confirmed among recent arrivals. New Zealand was hailed for our efforts in getting our COVID-19 cases down to zero. But in the last week, the numbers have crept back up. New Zealand, a country known for its beautiful landscapes, its rugby team, its small flightless birds, and now its fast and furious approach to tackling the coronavirus outbreak. One that looks to be successful so far. I'm Christopher Hope, the Telegraph's chief political correspondent. And on today's Chopper's Politics, we'll be looking at how this approach has fared and what Britain could learn from its Kiwi friends. The country locked down and closed its borders on the 25th of March, when they had only around 200 confirmed cases and no deaths. 75 days later, the country's Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, announced it had become one of the first countries to eliminate the virus. What's your immediate reaction when you heard there were no active cases of COVID-19 remaining in New Zealand? Um, I, I did a little dance. Then two British women and a man who flew in from Pakistan were announced to brought in cases. The fight is not over yet. So to discuss how the country kept cases down and why their aim from the start was the full elimination of the virus rather than just a squash the sombrero, to quote another Prime Minister, I gave the country's Deputy Prime Minister Winston Peters a call. Winston Peters is a long-standing politician. He first entered the New Zealand Parliament in 1978 in the early 1990s, he co-founded and led New Zealand First, a populist party whose aim is to put the interests of the country first in what it calls pragmatic and common sense representation in Parliament. He's held roles including Treasurer and Foreign Affairs Minister, and in 2017, New Zealand First formed a coalition government with the Labour Party, making him the country's Deputy Prime Minister for the second time. He's also a very busy man, as you'll hear in this interview, we got interrupted briefly when the voting bell went off in the New Zealand Parliament. We talked about the prospects of Britain tightening the links to the Commonwealth after Brexit, and even why a new Royal Yacht Britannia could help. And we started with the most important topic of all, the weather. Winston Peters, Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand, welcome to Chopper's Politics. Uh, how, how is the weather in New Zealand? Well, we're in the middle of our winter, and despite that, and I'm in the capital city, which is Wellington, often known as the Windy City, <laughs> but the weather hasn't been too bad at all. Very good, very good. We've been watching uh, somewhat enviously from the UK about how you've dealt with COVID-19. It's been quite a success the way you've been able to zero in on, the, on that dreadful virus that still, still is a big problem in the UK. What, what, what's your secret? Well, we went early and we went hard and... Uh, the fact is that five million New Zealanders were at the front line to, to make it work. They seriously uh, followed the uh, message, stuck to the hymn sheet, so to speak. And uh, the last case of community transmission was on the 28th of April. We've done some massive testing, of course, as well. Uh, but the, the, we've got some cases that have been imported in from people coming back from around the world. That is New Zealanders returning home. We always knew that we were going to have cases like that, but they're going straight into 14-day quarantine, being tested on day three and day 12. And we believe we can, if we rigorously stick to the quarantine regime and the rules, we will contain it. So you test through quarantine, do you, on day three and day 12? That's quite interesting. And that means that they must report to be tested and, and see whether they actually got the disease. That's right. Your aim, of course, is virus elimination. We had a big controversy in the UK about herd immunity. Is that an idea which you subscribe to in New Zealand? No, it's not an idea we subscribe to. I can see it's sort of a Darwinian in this context. But the problem is that I've looked at some of the countries in Scandinavia, for example, where they adopted the uh, herd immunity approach and it backfired, so to speak. And, and every country is different. But we're an island nation and we believe that we would be best able to handle this issue if we could uh, localise and identify where we had the problems. And we had just over 1,500 cases and in the end, uh, 21 deaths. So uh, it, it's a good record, but um, no one can afford to let up and, or lighten up on this issue, really. I mean, the question on this issue of elimination or eradication, the phraseology doesn't quite fit because 
it's clear that this is not a case where we can eliminate or eradicate until we get a vaccine. And that's why uh, cooperating with other countries is so critical to us. Are you now out of lockdown as it was before, or are you still in the last kind of vestiges of it? We're in the last vestiges of it, and that 97% of the uh, businesses that can go back to work are back at work. So not totally out of lockdown, but very close to it. Have you seen any kind of political divide about the lockdown? Certainly in the UK, the right has seemed to be more tended to get back to normal and, and maybe the left is arguably saying, let's stay more locked down. But that, that's not entirely exactly true, but there's a feeling that it, it's a bit like that here. How about you? Well, it's been a mixed bag. You had those people who are demanding that we go into lockdown faster, and yet I don't think any, other, any country, having discovered it, has moved as fast as we did. And then, of course, they were screaming to us to come out of lockdown earlier. And in many cases, that was justified because you can be over-conservative here. And uh, we, though, went out of lockdown two to one on the 8th of June, two weeks before people thought we would do it. So that was sound. And then there's, of course, a a whole lot of disputes as, well, we should have brought in all the export education students from offshore, although we had no capacity to contain and quarantine them. And they were a very difficult age group to quarantine, as we all know. And then there were arguments about opening up with other countries, including China. Now, these are some of the sort of, how shall I say, highly questionable suggestions being made across the political divide. But I suppose that's politics. Yeah, quite. I gather um, Ashley Bloomfield, your Director of General of Health, has been made quite a celebrity there. There's even a St. Ashley Shrine erected in Wellington. Is that right? Well, to be honest, he's one of your uh, you know, public servants who has just got on with the job and explained with precision and in the medical language that he knew what he was talking about and the level of understanding that the public picked up was quite enormous because there was nothing else to watch <laughs> at six o'clock at night. You, at one o'clock every day, you had a chance to <laughs> listen to Dr. Ashley Bloomfield about the latest update. We're the same here with Professor Chris Whitty and Sir Patrick Valance. They're, those are the scientific and medical advisors to, to the Boris Johnson in the UK. I think Chris Whitty is, is, is trending on Twitter quite a lot. Um, people have got secret crushes on the guy, so it's quite <laughs> probably alarming for him. When can Britain's visit New Zealand again? Are we hoping to get some kind of air corridor going? Well, I can uh, think with, <laughs> to the decision makers here, we're looking really hard at the British record. <laughs> and at the moment, we've got people coming back from the UK and we always knew that they were going to be COVID carriers. And so they've come straight here into quarantine. And uh, the public, though they were told there were going to be cases, having no community transmission here since the uh, 28th of April, were nevertheless upset that even these imported COVID cases had arrived here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're probably backpackers returning home, possibly. Well, there's a range. There's a range of people actually. There's no actual description, in the sense that uh, you, there's no clear pattern or similarity with many of the people coming home. Perhaps you may do a, a shorter route between, say, Australia and New Zealand across the the Tasman Sea. Well, again, we're trying to get the Tasman bubble going. That's a bubble between ourselves and Australia, and some specific island countries. But with Australia, as you know, they've got a federal system. And whilst the central federal government in Canberra gets to decide who can come to Australia interstate, that's decided by the state government. And you've got some COVID-free and highly creditable COVID-free record states like Tasmania and Queensland, and some like in Victoria where there's been some serious spikes of late. So we have tried to say to them, we don't have the chance to open up state by state, but let's open up a state or some states with New Zealand. But let's get back to normal as fast as we can. To what extent do you blame China for the situation? By that, I mean, we know it originated in a China wet market, but do you think it may have been something else, like a Chinese lab where this virus ran out of control? Well, one of the reasons why we did call for an early full-scale inquiry was that if we were going to learn from this, we needed to know with detail and precision, what had happened so that in the future we would have um, taken the lessons and acted in cases possibly coming in the future, act more quickly. That, in the end, of course, became a resolution at the World Health Assembly 
of the WHO, which was unanimously backed and even China backed it. So I can't answer that question. I've seen a lot of theories, but as you know, proof is what you want, evidence is what we want. We noticed that there was a breakout in Beijing recently, and that was associated with a wet market. But again, there's no evidence of its origin. In Wuhan, we're still trying to find out, and we need to know what caused it. What advice, Winston, would you give the UK as an island nation dealing with this pandemic? Of course, we have more people living here, but there's lots of similarities with your country. Well, it's very difficult. I've looked at the British figures and they're you know, very heavy and very, very serious. You, you've been uh, watching what Boris Johnson's been doing, have you? You think he was too late on, on the, the measures that you took quite early in New Zealand? Well, you can't you know, criticise other countries. They've all got different circumstances. Yes and different influences to react to. And I don't think it sort of helps the narrative because there are a whole serious wide range of reactions. And if you look at the UK, there's not much difference between the UK and Spain, UK or, and, dare I say it, um, Germany, uh, or the UK and France. So there's a similarity about it. And although you're an island nation, I mean, the distance between the countries is so close, whereas we've got 2,000 kilometres between ourselves and our neighbours. We're approaching Brexit at the end of this year. We're told we are actually leaving this implementation period that followed the leaving from the European Union on the 31st of January. Is it time for a UK-New Zealand bilateral trade deal, Winston Peters? Well, I came to the UK and in preparation for the 23rd of June 2016 referendum <laughs> and made a uh, address to the House of Lords Committee at the time to say it's going to happen and we need to look at the UK's business and commercial and trade relationships around the world. Because the UK, naturally, being in the Commonwealth of 2.2 billion people in over 50 countries, this was, I believe, then an opportunity to start working on the UK's re-emergence in the world of going global, so to speak. And uh, then there were countries like New Zealand and Australia, which are seriously natural partners where we've got across the divide seasonal differences, so we're not competing with the UK in so many ways. And we've got uh, trade, education, science, cultural, people-to-people ties, and above all, democracy and the rule of law. These are important to share those things. Quite. I, I, I'm intrigued about how you, how you knew it was, was going to happen. Do you put a bet on? Because it was certainly no one else expected Brexit here. I think it was a, it was an idea, not a likelihood, but before the referendum in 16. Well, the reason was I don't believe the polls and believe that I could read from what I knew that out there, particularly in the Labour electorates, there was a massive disconnect between the Labour constituency and the Labour Party. And it showed in the polls as well. And then, of course, I had the benefit of the best pulses that I know. I got into, got into some London taxi cabs and I asked the driver what he thought. <laughs> <laughs> and the readout was massive. <laughs> so I went public and said they're going to leave. OK, brilliant. And, and you saw it happen a, a long way away. So a, a deal soon by when? Have you got a date in mind between UK and New Zealand? Well, we formally launched the deal, uh, the negotiations, that is, on the 17th of June. Yeah, good. And, uh, you know, we are certainly game ready because we've had to, as a trading nation, do so much of these deals with other countries in Asia and around the world. So, in a sense, uh, we're match fit when I believe that because of the tie with the um, European Union, it's something new for the UK in that context. But that's not the point. We are set to go. We want a high quality agreement. We've got food products and benefits from New Zealand counter seasonal production of fresh produce and protein. You've got the engines, pharmaceuticals, vehicles, a whole lot of things that we want. And I hope that we get a high quality agreement and with speed. Quite. I, I think from our supermarket shelves, we know about Anchor Butter. And I remember back to New Zealand Lamb, Wendy Craig, who's an actress who used to promote it in the 80s here on, on the television. So we'll see more of your products maybe on the shelves here. Well, you know, I hope that the English primary production sector do not see us as competitors. The reality is that we can complement each other and do better internationally. That's the real key. What's your advice for our farmers? Should should they be worried about this prospect of a US trade deal on farming? Because right now there's lots of concern about about quality falling. It's it's the parliamentary bells going for the boat. (laughs) 
I'm not doing it on purpose. I'm afraid uh, <laughs> this bell, this, this bell, like the tide, waits for no man. We're the same bell uh, in, in the UK, uh, in, in our Parliament. Yeah. Coming out to the US is terribly hard to read because of the statements coming out of the government, and a lot of those statements are highly highly protectionist. So you, we're not reading into an environment where the ground rules are, as we'd expect, known. What we don't know, we don't know, because we don't know what's going to happen next. Who do you think will win in November, Biden or Trump? Well, you know, it weeks a long time in politics. At the moment, the polls would have uh, a clear 10% spread, I believe, uh, in the key, in some of the key switch states. The question is whether whether you are seeing a trend and whether the trend holds up. Uh, there are a number of factors which I could say uh, and that I think will colour this. The problem is I'm going to be the Minister of Foreign Affairs and demonstrating a level of diplomacy. <laughs> if this got published in the United States, I uh, wouldn't be doing my country any good. <laughs> of course not. Uh, suffice to tell you that, not being arrogant here, but it is a fact that in 2016, uh, I said that Donald Trump was going to win and I told them why. And the reason was that there was a huge suspicion and dislike of what was happening in Washington and that somebody could ride it all the way home. Now, that doesn't tell you that or say what my political bias was. I was just reading out a fact. And at the time when he launched that campaign, at the very start, he was 32% behind Hillary Clinton, but he still won. And what I did see also was the inaccuracy of the pollsters who just couldn't get their head around the fact that a silent America, very much like in the UK Brexit uh, referendum, these silent people were keeping it close to their chest, but when they hit the polling booth, they were then going to make their statement. And it's that same group who, who voted voted for Brexit, as you as you saw before that vote as well, isn't it? This is this overlooked uh, overlooked group of people who 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 resent the elite, I suppose. Well, they did, and they uh, did uh, understand one thing though, that this time that in the case of the Brexit polls and the Brexit twenty third uh, June decision. They knew that this decision, they would have a say, that they would be in control. In fact, these were the slogans that were being used. And so people that hadn't voted, just like the US in 2016, for 35 years were enrolling for the first time in voting. Now, that is a sort of a, that unknown political faction is dynamite, and no pulses were reading it. Are you optimistic for the UK about the, about the opportunity of Brexit? Yes, I am, because... Uh, when you look at it, in the end, the, U, the EU still needs Britain, needs them seriously. But I think it enables the UK that has always been, not in terms of its economics, but in terms of its uh, political reach, globalist. And uh, those are the facts. This is a chance to actually reconnect with some serious emerging economies. And the EU connection would not allow that. And in many ways, the Commonwealth was seen as a rival to the EU. And in, within the UK, although we have a foreign and Commonwealth office, I think there was definitely a degree that the Commonwealth was put on the back burner next to the European Union. But one of the problems, Christopher, was that some of these bodies that were connecting, meant to be connecting with the Commonwealth and the 50 plus countries in the Commonwealth, well, how shall I put it, put it politely? There needed to be a far greater vision and a far greater commitment to make this political, albeit amorphous and very loose association, to make it mean something. I watched over the years, decades, where these talk fests were not resulting in the kind of outcomes of economic improvement and social change. So right now, then, you see a real chance, do you, for the Commonwealth to take off and become this much more meaningful economic bloc, maybe? Well, I believe so. When the countries like India get to understand, and this is an emerging, seriously emerging economy of 1.4 billion people, when they realise that it's in their interest to be a part of a wider association, and there are countless other countries like that as well, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are all in the same boat here, it just gives us greater uh, leverage to facilitate the opportunities and the strengths of different sectors in all of our countries. We'll do better by all doing better trade together. There's been talk in the UK here, and we have a campaign at the Daily Telegraph in London about it for a replacement for the Royal Yacht Britannia. I wonder what you <laughs> thought of that. 
Well, I have actually, but <laughs> it's purely serendipitous that I did. I happened to run across an article, but I have been on the old Britannica. Uh, have you? <laughs> yes, I have. A long, long time ago. With the Queen for, for, for cocktails? Yes. However, I, uh, I can see what the problem might be, and that is the kind of politics accepting. If you see the positive side of it, as they chant to uh, broadcast and demonstrate uh, Project Britain's image in terms of many of the things to do with medicine and health and what have you, you can turn a negative very quickly into a serious positive. That's where it will work. And it could, it could be a connection between the Commonwealth and the UK. It could, it could be this kind of this, this physical connection as well. Oh, certainly. I mean, it makes sense, though, in a modern context, to not just have a maritime asset for the royal family. It could be a maritime asset used by the royal family, but when it's not being used, doing some serious work for spreading brand Britain around the world. I mean, I'm talking from a New Zealand perspective, but I could believe there's is a chance where it would be of serious benefit to to the UK and its image. The big issue here is money. So in pounds, it'd be £100 million for a new Royal Britannia. Do you think the Commonwealth could help fund it? Almost certainly not. <laughs> what do you think? Well, in terms of value for your brand, you'll get your money back. In these COVID-19 troubled economic times, I don't think... Taking the hat around the Commonwealth is a very good idea. <laughs> uh, yes, no, just that, as, uh, how should I say it, um, all around the Commonwealth and all around the world indeed, this COVID-19 has been devastating uh, for countries and uh, we've all had to tighten our belts, so to speak, and start targeting our expenditure to ensure that wealth creation and jobs and business gets back to normal as fast as possible. When we get on top of things, you might ask us about Britannia, but I'm thinking You'd want this to be a more clear and present the situation. Uh, but I don't think neither Australia nor New Zealand or Canada would be able to help at this point in time. And guess what our constituency would be saying? <laughs> I think so. But maybe before long we'll see it. We'll see a, a new yacht in the harbour at Auckland. Winston Peters, it's been great to speak to you. And thank you so much for coming on Truffles Politics and, and good luck with the, with the pandemic. Yes, it's been a pleasure. And thanks for having me on. And uh, given our connections, special connections, the language, the law, democracy, we wish the British people all the very best. Thanks so much. Well, that is fascinating to hear how one island nation has dealt very firmly with the coronavirus outbreak. And also from a country on its own, in the middle of the South Atlantic, who reckons that Brexit can be a success for the UK, and even, guess what? We might need a new Royal Yacht Britannia to make it a real success. So thank you then to Winston Peters, New Zealand's Deputy Prime Minister. Thanks to my producers, Louisa Wells, Elliot Lampitt, and Theo Luludis. But most importantly of all, and I mean this, thank you to you for listening. If you like the show, please tell a friend about it. Pick up the phone and tell your sister, your delivery driver, pass the pod. I'd be so grateful if you could also leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. It really helps other people find this show in a very crowded field out there. If you have something you want to tell us, maybe a guest you'd like to hear on the show, please email us, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweet us at chopperspolitics. If you're all caught up on Chopper's Politics and twiddling your thumbs, head to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper or you can get 30 days free access to all of our best coronavirus coverage, opinion, sport, politics, culture and much, much more. All completely free of charge. And always, if you can, and it's safe to do so, please buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. Until next time, cheerio!